uh, instructional innovation, health careers. A lot of people came together to put um, to bring Tabitha here. Um, she is a uh, ICC alumni, graduated in 2006. When she came to us, I knew she was leadership bound, but I didn't know how high she was going to go. Um, and we have this little saying that Professor Jackson has said uh, for a long time, and that is, when you when you get out, it's, you're just building the foundation. And on that foundation, you can build a castle or a shack. And uh, she has built a castle. So, uh, Tabitha, thank you. Hello, everyone. I have some familiar faces. I have new faces. So I'm Tabitha, I'm a respiratory therapist at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., which is where I've been since I graduated. So when I left here, I already secured a job and kind of moved out. So what I wanted to talk about today is growing indispensable skills and dispensable times, because with the economy, I've found that depending on the area that you're in, you're, sometimes you have difficulty finding a job. I have my students currently are asking for advice, and I kind of went with that on such. And sitting through interviews, I have learned that there's a lot of common skills that people miss. So some of the things we're going to talk about are the qualities that hiring managers are looking for. So when I was prepping this out, I sent out 45 to 50 emails to hiring managers across the country that were from children's hospitals, adults' hospitals, and this is the themes of what they were looking for, and it was surprising to hear some of the stuff of their horror stories as well. Um, we want to discuss the qualities they're looking for, explain the attributes that are going to make you stand out about the, through the crowd, illustrate some of the different approaches to interviewing, because medical interviews are a little bit different than some of the other ones, and looking at helpful hints for job interviews in general. So it's going to be a little interactive because though I like to hear myself speak, I want to hear you guys. So what do you think is the number one quality that hiring managers are looking for? Number one, first thing that comes to mind. Hair. What was it? Hair. A smile. Teamwork. Teamwork. That's a good one. That's, that's not number one. It is on. Attendance is always huge. Personality. How about communication? That is the number one skill. But everything else is included, and we'll talk about those later. So communication skills are the number one thing that they're talking about. So has anyone ever heard of people having problems for over-communicating? So, and this is why we lift on three. <laughs> In talking to some different people, this is from Joshua Kosa from Children's Hospital of Orange County. He's found with his students that we are definitely cyber people and we've lost communication skills with texting and our interpersonal skills are less. So this is just one of his quotes. And my initial reaction with most students, they cannot hold a professional conversation or look me in the eyes. So when you're dealing with patients at the bedside, you want that interpersonal skill. You want to be able to work with them. So what are the parts of communication? We do, it, we do it every day, right? It seems easy, but communicating effectively takes finesse. So you have to choose your right words. And I think this is the biggest one, listening with our minds and not just our ears. So when you're listening to someone, absorb it in, take it in, because you can go in one ear and out the other, but if you actually See what they're saying to you. We want to get our message across. And these are all skills that we need to work on. So even myself, I've been out there a while. You have to figure out, what, why aren't they getting it? What can I do to communicate better? So what does a miscommunication cause? Anybody? Confusion. Confusion? What else? Mistakes. Mistakes. Arguments. At the workplace, it can result in poor productivity, which, if you're a manager, what do you not want? 
poor productivity. Unmot unmotivated employees. If, you're, if you have a manager that is not a good communicator, it doesn't make you want to do your job. And in our world, mistakes lead to lawsuits, right? So what are the three parts to a communication? Verbal, so that's a type of communication. Nonverbal. Nonverbal is another type of communication. So you have your sender, so the person like me who's trying to communicate something to you effectively, right? You have the message that you're trying to communicate, and the person who's receiving the message. If any of those three are confused, your communication doesn't go across. So what are the parts of our messages? We have our content, what we want to communicate our process, how you choose to communicate it, your feedback, was it effective? Because you might think something's effective. I'm sure everybody's had a fight with their significant other and you think you're communicating to them and they're just not getting it. They don't understand why you're mad. So in football season's here, right? So this is our cycle of communication. So you always want to get that positive feedback on your message. It's the ability to listen, consider, and collaborate with others in a meaningful and collegiate manner. Most successful leaders are good listeners and are willing to listen to others. So if you think of bosses that you've had in the past, the ones that would take your opinion, you probably enjoyed better than the ones that didn't, right? And this came from uh, the David Moore Jr., the administrative director at HUP in cardiopulmonary diagnostics. So what's another thing, I think somebody said that attitude is something else that hiring managers are looking for. You can, you meet somebody, you can tell if they have a positive attitude or a negative attitude. Um, so what you have to do is kind of look at that. What, <coughs> what do you think makes a positive attitude? Something that, <coughs> optimism? Willingness to learn something. Hope. Hope. Hope's a good one. It provide, a good attitude provides improved communication because if you have a good attitude, you're willing to listen to other people. If you have a negative attitude, you've just put your brick wall up and they can see that. You get better teamwork, higher productivity, which makes a hiring manager very happy. And you get opposite when it deals with your negative attitude. So, what affects your job attitude? Choose a job you love. Choose, work at a place you want to work at. Choose the right organization. Every hospital that I've been to, visited, or have worked at has a different feel to it. They have a culture. You want to make sure that you make that culture fit. Show your attitude. And this one's, I think, the biggest one. Be solution-minded and not problem-focused. So if you see every place has problems, instead of complaining about them, figure out how do you improve it. That's, that's one of the huge aspects there. What also affects attitude, give your best at your job. Never criticize anyone. We all have faults. If somebody makes a mistake, help them make them, if they don't realize it, do it in a positive manner. Stay away from gossip, which is hard to do. <laughs> but it, if you get involved in those aspects of an environment with work, it shows a negative attitude. Be constructive, don't complain, come with solutions, take vacations. If you don't take a vacation, I live for the next vacation. That's, it gives you that attitude, you're working towards something. You need a break. Medical field is very emotionally draining at times. And that break away from the vacation, it could be a staycation, it's still very helpful. So this is coming from Jeffrey Davis, he's the director at UCLA. And one of the top candidates from his recent interviews never did clinical rotations at his hospital. She was impressive with her attitude, her work ethic, came in with glowing references from her managers, and she had a genuinely positive attitude that was infectious. You cannot teach that in a classroom. 
So as much as Kelly and Pam and all your other instructors are there, they can't teach you attitude, they can't teach you dedication, they cannot teach you work ethic. And that's what a hiring manager is looking for. When it comes to students, <coughs> uh, one of the men I spoke to, he said, a new grad's resume is all the same. They have their clinical rotations, they all went to the same places, what makes them stand out is their attitude. I'm not interested in their clinical skills because we discover that during the first days, but one thing I can't be taught is an attitude, and that's what I'm looking for. And that's from Carl Voss at Suburban Hospital in Maryland. So what else are hiring managers looking for in their employees? We're in the medical field. They want to have an idea of your critical thinking and decision making. So when, what are aspects of critical thinking? When I'm here asking, what do you think about critical thinking? What, what do you think about? What have you seen during your clinical rotations or your work? Problem solving. Problem solving. So what are the, there's different things that make problem solving. So for, I'm a respiratory therapist, prioritize. If you prioritize your work, you're going to be more effective. Being able to negotiate and deal with issues as they happen. Discuss and communicate. Anticipate. And I think that's the biggest thing that really good respiratory therapists are anticipating what's next. Why are they trending the way they are? You notice that one little thing, and does that trigger you to make that difference that keeps that patient from coding? Or needing some other advanced support. So with critical thinking, problem solving in the complex world, we acquire our information, we find our answers to our questions, we create new ideas, we foster teamwork, because critical thinking sometimes isn't done by yourself. When you come up across a situation that you've never seen before, you can go to somebody who knows and understands maybe a little bit more than you, have had a little more experience, and that helps your patients. And you want to promote options. When you're dealing with physicians or different people, you want to be able to say, you know what, I like your idea. I've done this several times. But I think this will be more effective. And you negotiate. Maybe you try your idea first. Maybe you try their idea first. But you make the agreement, if it doesn't work, we're going to look at our options. We want to make sure that we, we have a plan B if it doesn't work. They're also looking people-centric. That is the new buzzword in the medical field. What do you think people-centric means? Being able to get along with everybody. Being able to get along? What else? Empathy. Empathy. Empathy is number one. There is a difference between empathy and sympathy. So empathy is the number one thing when you're dealing with patients. Being compassionate and understanding, kind of putting yourself in their shoes. Customer service. Being people-oriented and being value-focused. So you want to make sure that with your, when you're going around, I know for me, I visited a hospital recently and I didn't know where the heck I was going and the people were like, you look lost, where can I help you? Even those little things make that person stay in your hospital more important. And does, does everybody know what's going on with Medicare? And how they are going to be affecting, how patient satisfaction is going to be affecting reimbursement rates? I see some heads nodding, I have some people confused. So Medicare is now going to say patient satisfaction matters to us. We want you to be people-centric. If you get bad surveys, your reimbursement goes down. If your reimbursement goes down because you have bad customer service, you're, we're going to look at some tumbling in the future. So the first one is from Armand. I can't say his last name. He's from the director at New England Sinai. Connecting with our staff and our staff with our patients is much more subjective, but perhaps even more important. And Dana Evans from Mercy in St. Louis, customer service is 
not to only to treat our patients and families with respect, but every coworker they encounter, professionalism is paramount. So this is the new buzzword out in the, the medical field. I try to look it up, it's hard to find, but everybody's talking about it. And the last thing, like more of the core qualities, somebody said that earlier, team player. So what, make, what do you look for in a team member that's working with you? What would you want to see with a coworker? Support. Support? Someone who says that's not my job, but just does it. Okay. You don't want to hear that's not my job. You want somebody to say, hey, you know what? It might not be my job, but I'm sure it's going to heck help you, right? <clears throat> As somebody who's done the schedule in a facility, Flexibility, being able to work with others, right? Being able, I've had days where you're assigned to this area. Well, by 10 o'clock, I've had three different assignments. I go with a smile. They all, you just get it done. You want them to be cooperative. I like my, my people that I work with to be as organized as I am. Doesn't always happen. Honesty. Willing to take on new responsibilities. That's huge. When you learn things in school, you're going to come out, you're going to be out there. But taking on new responsibilities is huge. If there's committees in your facilities, if there's different, like I did the schedule, that was volunteer, that was a job with no appreciation. But I took it on anyway. Did not participate in gossip. Again, team player. I don't want to talk about others, and you want to be safe with everybody. So this is from Lee Evie, the director at Texas Children. Some of our best employees look at going above and beyond as standard practice, whereas many of our new staff wouldn't even consider going the extra mile without a little coaxing and prodding. What do you think that's saying? Lazy. Lazy. Working with people, and I'm, I'm not that old, but when I look at some people coming in that are about 10 years younger than me, there seems to be like this idea of entitlement. I don't need to work as hard. I worked hard to get where I am. You need to work hard to get there too. <laughs> so I think that also with that, if you're the person who's working hard, mentoring others, taking that opportunity to get somebody involved, coaching them on. I'm doing that at work right now. Like, come on, you, can, you want to be on the committee? Do it. I don't want to be on it. Let somebody else do it. And this is coming from Bill Howard. He's from Tufts. I want employees with fresh ideas. Never accept the status quo. If they have evidence-based alternatives, employees who can accept change is what our patients deserve when the opportunities present themselves. So with that, I think he, he hits the nail on the head. Let's move. The status quo is not going to get the respiratory profession and or other medical professions out there. So what are the things that can make us stand out? Resumes and cover letters, right? These are some of the things that can get you that job interview. When was the last time anybody wrote a resume or cover letter? <laughs> this week. <laughs> it's an introduction of yourself, right? The, the resume in, introduction, it needs to be a little bit half page, not too lengthy, because if you start writing a dissertation, they're going to look at it and they're like, oh, there's too much. I have 200 applications to go through. It lets them know what job you're looking for. It gets them to read your resume. That is the 100% biggest purpose of the cover letter. It highlights your skills, explains your experience, what qualifications you have, not too lengthy, get to a point. It's not a lecture. <laughs> and I think this is the most interesting one that I've had. Jeffrey Davis, he's again from UCLA. Make yourself stand out. 
It's a manager's market right now. He, he had 200 applicants for 14 PRN positions. That's, that ratio is kind of lopsided, right? I can choose from the cream of the crop right now. Make yourself the employee I cannot live without. If you go in with a positive attitude, you can talk about being a team player, you can make yourself that therapist they can be, can't live without. For me, when I interviewed, I did a phone interview. I went out to Washington, D.C. I had my job offer in March. I graduated in July. I got very lucky. And I wanted to make them, I wanted to be the student they couldn't live without. So having those skills out there. Resumes. What is a resume? What's the purpose of your resume? Like job experience. Job experience. Education. It's the marketing document to convince the reader that you are the best person for that particular job. <coughs> Resumes are your commercial. You need to, that 30 second commercial that tries to get you to eat Taco Bell, that is what your resume is for you. You wanna get that person to give you that chance and let, you see, let them see you in person. It needs to be easy to read. And you want to focus on your achievements. As a student, what, what could be an achievement that you could put on your resume? Dean's list. Dean's list? <coughs> I didn't hear it. Class president. Class president. Okay. That shows what? Leadership. <coughs> you have to make yourself stand out. Service. Service. Starting an organization. Starting an organization. Did somebody start one? No? <laughs> what other things can make you stand out? Yeah, student of the year. Student of the year. You know what? I tell you, there's a lot of um, student presentations at different things, and I remember we went one year and I did a presentation and I got offered a job. I didn't end up there, but he's like, you know what? I'll take, when you graduate, you have a job here if you want it. A different, a year later, so I went, that was my freshman class. A year later, went to a different one, talked to somebody. I got offered another job. I took that one. It was a PRM position, which I started before I started Children's. So I. I had a job before I even, two jobs before I even graduated. And just being out there and talking to people, letting them know what skills you have. If you're changing careers, speak to the experience that you have. A lot of people think that they're only looking for skills in respiratory. If you did customer service, that tells me that you have skills to deal with patients. If you're somebody who says, oh, I worked at McDonald's and I hated every minute of it, that, you're, you're not the person I'm going to hire. Because you know what? Every day, my job is customer service and making people and dealing with various people. And that was actually an example from one of the managers I spoke with. Clearly show your skills and experience that can be transferred to your new position. So for a lot of people I know in my class, we had people changing careers. I changed career. This is my second career. <laughs> so other things with your resumes. Show them how you will benefit their facility, not how they will benefit you. I think that a lot of people kind of look at, I'd like to get here because it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you. It is going to help you, but... How are you going to benefit them? Are you a culture fit to their facility? Be honest and accurate. If you are not honest during your interview, 
they are going to figure it out on that first couple days. And with that, I'm going to question whether or not do you have the integrity to take care of my patients. Do not have misspellings or be, have bad grammar in a resume. So there are programs that facilities that get a lot of resumes have and they will filter out mistakes and spellings and those resumes get tossed. So you have one mistake in there, it should be a representation of you. And then with, you want to use action words. So what, can anybody give me an action word? Creative. Creative. I didn't hear that. Increased. Increased. Organized. Organized. Executed. <laughs> Executed, not executed. You don't want to be using the word eradicated. Right? Redesign, initiate, cultivate, motivated. There are other programs that look for these words in resumes. Just the way they're looking for misspellings, they're looking for people that use action words. And if you go to uh, the UVA Business School, the Darden Business School, they have a wonderful document that has about 150 action words through, starting with every letter of the alphabet. That's where I got these. Use your resources. So for students here, you have your ICC resources. They have free workshops, interviewing, resume critiquing, job assistance, open labs. These are all things that are free. And these people have been trained in these things, so they can help you. So now you've got the interview. What do you think makes you stand out once you're there? Sure. Appearance. All right. So in the United States, we have a bad problem with eye contact. So being able to look somebody in the eyes, it's not something that's supposed to be intimidating. If you go overseas, everybody's looking at you straight in your face. It's a different culture. They're looking for politeness. If you're polite with the people that you're interviewing, you'll maybe be polite with my patients. Body language. What do you think, what's the difference between good body language and bad body language? Posture. Posture. So if I was sitting here like this in an interview, right, kind of, disinterested, not kind of lean into people. If you ever do any research on dating, it says you're on a good date if both people are leaning into each other. Kind of same thing on an interview. You want a good body language. This one's kind of hard to control, but facial expressions. One of my favorite coworkers, she knows that this is not her, this is her weak point. So she's like, I walked into a room and I just had to bug my eyes out because I didn't want them to realize that I was bugging my eyes out. It made it seem like it was normal. <laughs> well, she was sh surprised when she went into the room. So you have comfort with human contact. For medical professionals, that is huge. You know, if, if you don't like people, the medical profession's not for you. And speak clearly with an adequate volume. I have several patients that are where I'm at in Washington, D.C., most of my students are not originally from the United States. So they have different cultures, and the one speaks very, very softly. And I told her, this is not going to work for an interview. I've been to interviews where they speak softly, and if they have to ask you what 15 times, it's not going well. Self-awareness. So what do you think mean, being self-aware? That's the number one that I'm going to hit on. Know your weaknesses. You know what? Know your strengths. Know your weaknesses. We all have them. So when you go into a job interview, you should have a canned answer for these two questions.
Gentleman in the green, I don't know your name. What's a weakness that you have? Give me one. Yes, green, turquoise, it's green. Andre. Okay. What's, what, what's something else? Give me anything. If you were, because a lot of people never, they never expect the question, yet it's always asked. Experience. Okay, experience. You know what? I'm a new graduate. The fact that I, this is going to be my first job if I get it. But you know what? I am willing to work hard and gain the experience. What else? Donnie? I'm too organized. All right. Too organized, making a, making, being, being over, but you can be over organized. One of my coworkers, I love her to death, but she's one of those ones with that multicolored pen and it's, that, that's, writes her report sheet out and you can, so being too organized. Too nice. Too nice. Weaknesses. That's taking, a, that's taking something positive, putting it in the negative to make it positive. A lot of managers kind of see through that. Because you don't want to say something that you're weak on. But if you can't identify a weakness, you, everybody has something to work on. I have something to work on. Everybody has something to work on. My weakness, sometimes I don't have a good work-life balance. And work wins. And not having a good work-life balance is not good for a professional. Yes? For me, it would be sometimes prioritization. And then, you know what? I'm not necessarily always very good at prioritizing, but I'm working on that. I'm getting that multicolored pen, <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to look at everybody has something. No one wants to admit it, and this is the number one thing that I think is interesting. And uh, Elaine was talking about some, there's some odd questions you get asked on interviews. So I was asked, what, what was the last book you read? Why do you think he asked me that? Because you were keeping up on your class. Because you weren't prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for it. You, that's a good one. He, actually, for that, I asked him why. I did get that job, and I work there. And I said, why do you ask? And he goes, I want to make sure that you're, you're not always reading journals or not, you want to have good work-life balance is what he was looking for. My girlfriend interviewed the same thing. She said, you know what, I really, all I do read is the journals because that's, when I have time, that's what I do. But what do you like to do for fun? I, th I think my favorite question that I heard today was, if you were a salad dressing, t a, a, a piece of, a, in a salad, which piece would you be and why? These are, qu these are dead serious questions on interviews. But what are they looking at? Combination of creativity, but there's things that you can say. So, if you were, if you were my lady in the pink, if you were in a salad, what piece would you be? These are the ones that throw you off. Yeah. <laughs> Elaine, answer your I Elaine was asked this question. I was asked this question two years ago, and I said I would be a piece of cheese because I am firm but also flexible. I can work, I can work in a team environment, but I can also work well on my own. So I'll add, if you don't mind, Tabitha, I was on a hiring committee at ICC, and I asked if I may ask a fun question because we have a process here. And I was told yes, and, and the other three people in the room with me didn't know I was going to ask this question. And I asked the same question of the person we were interviewing, and in my opinion, he nailed it. He said he would be a jalapeno pepper. And he was, inter he was interviewing for the fitness center manager position. And he said, because he likes to fire people up and get them motivated. And I thought, you know, that was really great how he answered it for the job he was interviewing for. So, so I know for a fact that these questions are more common because several of my friends have just been caught totally off guard with, with questions. So Recently I know that they asked um, at the hospital that I work at to women that were, women or men that were going for a nurse manager position 
if you could try three of the drugs that we give patients, which ones would they be and why? And the answer of I wouldn't want to try any didn't work. <laughs> and I had a discussion with a doctor and she's like, I'd like the lauded because CFers seem to love it. I want to know what it feels like. Penobar because I'll get an amazing sleep. And ketamine because it's supposed to be very, very wacky. <laughs> you know, so these are, re these are real questions that are out there that you kind of, they throw you off. But every facility is a little different and being prepared and knowing that they're out there is huge. For me, my weakness, distinguishing obstacles that may help you not have a work-life balance, it's important to have it. That's where those vacations come in, you know. And the question for you, would you be enjo enjoy the job you're applying for? Because an interview is not just them interviewing you. It's you interviewing them. How do you stand out? There's always, what, what are your goals? Make them realistic. Make them obtainable. So as a new grad, what would be a realistic goal that you could have if you were interviewing for a job? <coughs> All right. Everybody's goal is to get the job. Gain more experience. Gain more experience. One, if anybody's, I know you guys are members of the AARC, at least the student members are, because I doubt they've changed that. They uh, advanced credentialing. Someone made a comment, gee, I have a lot of letters after my name. I'm not there yet. There's about nine more, <laughs> or actually more than nine more that I'm planning to hopefully have by the end of the next two years. But have your goals. This one's huge, good work ethic. So when I say what is good work ethic, give me a descriptor. I didn't hear it. Discipline. Discipline. Timely. Timely. What else? Drive. Drive. So we have integrity. And I have, you know, I don't have all of these up here. Sense of responsibility. That sense of responsibility is actually what gives you your drive. You're responsible for getting your work done on time. You're responsible for caring your patients. You're responsible for taking care of your family at home, making sure everything's done. Emphasis on quality. You want to make sure that you're... I can go and get my treatments done, but you want to do it with quality as well. Sense of teamwork. If somebody's falling behind and you're ahead, help them out. So what's, Kelly talked about service. You know what stands out to me when I'm dealing with students and I give them opportunities? Volunteering. What organiz, what, how can you volunteer that would make you stand out? And this is what, those extra things for students that help them stand out. Student government. Student government. which they have to do in like what, HEOC 114? <laughs> I remember that. But there's a lot of things it, for, since most of you, everybody here is a respiratory therapist, you have COPD foundation. Do COPD checks. I guarantee you, you go to the mall and do COPD checks, you're gonna find tons of people that have COPD that didn't even know. There's a lot of factory workers here. You have <coughs> factory, Factory-associated asthma, just because of the work environments. So it shows you're giving back to your community. That means that you're going to be the person that goes the extra mile at work. And you can volunteer for your professional organization. I don't know, you have the ISRC here. I do VSRC meetings. Just going to those. Usually, there's a lot of hiring managers at those meetings. One of my students wants to work at UVA. 
I said, well, you want to meet the hiring manager, you should be coming to me with me to the VSRC meetings because she's there every time. So you can meet people. It's good networking. Honesty. Again, be truthful on your resume and about your abilities. You need to be able to speak to your resume. You should be able to, you know what's on it. They should be able to ask you a question. It shouldn't be like somebody else wrote it. So make sure that you know. Don't make up answers to questions. And if you guess it, it does mess up your credibility, right? So if you don't know something, say you don't know it, but you know what? I'll look that up when I get home. Get in touch with your character. And I think this is a, an odd statement to say because you want to make sure that you, you fit the character, like you have everything set together. What are you looking for? What are they looking for? Does it match? If you're joining a new profession or a current person in your profession, being enthusiastic about it. When you start getting that ho-hum kind of thing, you need to find something that's going to get your spark. Because if you don't, it becomes a job. And I didn't get into this because I wanted to have a job that I hated going to work every day. Good listening skills. You want to have your positive attitude. And I think this is the hardest one for medical professionals, willingness to accept change and try new things. Has anybody had that doctor that didn't want to try a new therapy because they didn't learn about it and then graduated school in like the 1930s? Willingness to accept change and drawing that person to it. If you come with evidence-based medicine to them, you should be able to have an intellectual conversation with another medical professional and at least get them to contemplate something new. That's what I do love about teaching hospitals. They, they have to stay on top of things. New grads need to demonstrate they know what they want and they're willing to come and get it. We do not want to see anyone that is disengaged, unmotivated, shy, or strictly task-oriented. That is from Steve, and I can't say his last name. He's the director at uh, University of Chicago. So you need to show you're enthusiastic. You're willing to work. And a couple of approaches to a job interview. For, your stu for the students that are out there, have you guys been on any job interviews recently? Trevor, Every day. You're in clinical, you are on a job interview. Yes, you've been on a job interview since the day you started respiratory school. <laughs> They're looking at your work ethic, your enthusiasm, now. From day one. Interview preparation. Understand the process. Every hospital has its own process. So if you get a job interview and that person from HR calls you and says, hey, we'd like to interview, it's always, what's the process, okay? That works. Research. What should you be researching for a job interview? What kind of hospital, their size? Mission. Mission. If you can tell them their mission during, why do you, they're always going to ask, why do you want to work here? Well, I re, your mission is this, and I feel that I align with that mission. Every hospital has a mission. Or do they have a specialty that you're interested in? One of the reasons that I went to where I was, they have respiratory ECMO, respiratory transport. So... Those are skills that I wanted that I specifically went to that facility for. Anticipate the questions. There are some standard interview questions like your weaknesses that they will ask. Be ready for them. Prepare your answers. Practice interviewing. If you haven't interviewed in a really long time or you know, this is your first time. I don't know. Everybody in the respiratory field is interesting. You have really, really young. You have older. You have career changers. So, does anybody know what a behavioral interview is? I, I see the experienced people saying yes. 
What does it sound like? How would you act? How did you do this? How would you act? How did you act? So most medical interviews are behavioral interviews. They ask you about situations they either put you in or they will ask about things that you've done in the past. What skills or abilities that you have. So you were in conflict with a coworker, a classmate. How did you resolve it? You're in the break room with coworkers that are not getting along. What would you do? You walk into a situation, a rapid response call. The anesthesiologist is bagging the patient and not focused on the chest rise. The chest is not rising. And it's the head of anesthesiologist at the hospital. What are you going to do? Behavioral interview questions. My hospital, most hospitals, they will be asking you clinical questions. Be prepared that you're going to have ABG situations or what would you do with the ventilator. But they're not going to be outlandish. It's just establishing basic respiratory knowledge. Give me an example. That is usually the beginning of a behavioral interview question. Communicate clearly a story about your position. So you're approaching your job interview. Your job is to have the or convince the interviewer that you have initiative, show your interest in skills, demonstrate mature competence to do the job, and you're the best fit for the job. How do you think you can prepare for behavioral interview questions? All right. So we'll make a list of what skills and traits do you have that are positive? Competencies to common jobs. You could talk about leadership, problem solving, teamwork, and other things that are tied to the role that you're seeking. You want to have examples, because these, again, are kind of common questions. Think about relevant, relevant examples on how you've mastered a particular skill. Show you possess the trait. And a lot of facilities use the STAR method. You talk about the situation. What context is your experience? Were you, was it a school experience? Was it a patient experience? You don't want to be too detailed, you don't want to bog them down, but give the situation you were in, the task, what was the specific challenge that you were up against? What was the goal of the situation? The action, what was your role? How were you involved? How did you deal with that situation? And what's the result? What was the outcome? Panel interviews. Has anyone ever had a panel interview? <coughs> I see some heads nodding. Does anybody know? What's a panel interview? She's shaking her head no. Interviewing is, uh, can be stressful in general with one person. A panel interview, there's a group of people. So time, it's interview day. The manager, the assistant, the educator, and maybe even just a staff person, because that's usually where I come in, will be there. So more than one inter person's interviewing you. You want to speak to all the interviewers, greet each interview, or individually shake hands. If you can, I always suggest go with a notebook or like a portfolio. Write down the names. Have your questions that you want to ask them already written down. You're going to be nervous. And when they ask you, do you have any questions to ask us? You don't want to be the person who doesn't have a question. Because that's going to put you at the bottom of the list. You don't want to ask about pay. You don't want to ask about benefits. That's usually all held by HR. And the department has nothing to do with it.
be relevant to the interviewers, so you want to make sure that you get them all engaged. That's kind of like a panel interview, but not, it's usually at a more, we do it at a conference table. So if they ask you a question, address the person who asked you first and add the others and make sure that you're looking a little bit at everybody. After the interview, what do you want to do after the interview? Thank them for their time. Write down some notes about the position, follow-up questions, evaluate the interview. So there's, in critical thinking, evaluation is a huge thing. You have to reflect. What did I do good? What did I not do so good? Reflecting about yourself is very difficult. What was the most difficult question that you were asked? Anticipate that question on another interview. If you feel like you stumbled, you can move forward. How do you feel after the interview? Gut instinct is usually good. Did it go good? Did it go bad? Keep track of the questions you were asked because if you interviewed at one place, chances are you will be asked that somewhere else. Especially the ones you did not answer well. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Preparation, it's just preparation, writing those notes down. Being nervous. I've interviewed several times. I usually, I'll go on interviews just to go on interviews and practice, even when I'm not looking for work. It's an odd hobby, I know. <laughs> but breathe deeply, you know? Get your heart rate down. Be grounded, you know? Put your hands in your lap. Don't fiddle. Don't chew your pencil. Take your time. If you need a moment to formulate an answer, take it. Because you're not going to be penalized for thinking, because in situations I'd want you to think, then just, I usually call it verbal vomit. Throw out an answer, just to throw out an answer. You can break eye contact. You don't have to stare at somebody. It's OK to break eye contact. Actually. Most people look away when they're thinking. So that's not a bad thing. It's like, okay, I need, a, I need a moment. And reflect. It's important to take a pause, reflect. You know, you don't want it to be a, I told you, like, have your answers prepared. You don't want them to know that you have canned answers to these questions. You want them to think you're thinking on the fly. Also, after the interview, Thank you notes and follow-ups. So your thank you note, make it timely. Guess what? It can be a thank you email. Most people will send you, uh, they'll give you business cards. If you can get a business card from every person at the table, great. If you only get it from one, no problem. Ask them to forward it to the other people that were there. Yeah. Reiteration. It's a second chance. If you didn't, there was something that you didn't feel you did well on, this is a kind of a chance that you can make it a little bit better. So if there was anything that you wanted to follow up or didn't add into the, your resume and in interviews, proofread, big thing on proofreading. And some helpful hints that, again, surprise me when people come to interviews. Be on time if you've never been to that facility. You want to do a dry run. I live in Washington, D.C. It now has the worst traffic in the country, over L.A. So my boss will interview you if you're late. You'll be sitting there for one to two hours waiting for him because you missed your time, but I guarantee you, you're wasting your time because he will not hire you. Plain and simple. You could be the best candidate he's seen. You were late. You are not getting the job. Building rapport and just small talk. There's usually the secretary that you might meet first. Chit chat with her. As you, just find little things to talk about. Not the weather. All right? Dress for success and bring a copy of your resume with you. Yes, they got a copy. 
Yes, HR has a copy, but you bring another copy on the nice paper, it's, it stands out. And when you're answering your questions, you want to listen. Make sure that you're answering the question that they ask. Listen with your mind and not just your ears. Focus on what they have to say. Give concise answers because they have a time frame. Usually for us, we have one hour You have before the next person is there to interview. So we like to try and keep it down. Summarize up front. Outline format, kind of like speaking in bullet points. Ask clarifying questions if you don't understand something. Get them to clarify because some, depending on a panel interview, I've been on a panel where someone was asking a question and I'm like, I totally understand why this person isn't understanding the question. And then I was like, you know what, this is the question she's asking because he looks confused. And closing questions, which is having those questions prepared <coughs> for, for the interviewer. Be your best. I or go to the interview alone. If you have kids, I'm not, I've, there's a reason why I say this. We've had them come to, to interviews. Eye contact, smile. You would be surprised on how many of the managers said just a smile would be nice. You're nervous, but smiling helps. Listen. Answer questions directly. Discuss your experiences. Do not speak ill of previous employers. So that's huge. Be confident, have manners, express your knowledge. No gum, no fragrances. Most hospitals are fragrance free. You're going for a medical position. As much as you might like your perfume, that's not the place. Wear appropriate shoes. And that might, appropriate for me, might be different for someone else, but we had a, recently a girl in the field for six years, had her nice blue high stiletto heels, and you know, it was just kind of like, I loved them if I was going to the nightclub, not for a job interview. And be smart with social media. Somebody has something, they have an idea in mind, right? Why do I say that? Some. Right, so some managers will actually kind of do some Facebook stalking, put your email in. Have an appropriate email address. <laughs> Hazel Eyes 1976 doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You, no. <laughs> I don't want to know what the woo-woo was. But have an appropriate email address. If When you're looking for jobs, have something that is professional sounding, you know, X, Y, Z, R, R, T, that's fine, but I, you'd be... I don't I say this because obviously I'm not, I'm not the only one running across these things. But be smart with social media. Also, once you have the job and you start friending your coworkers cuz you will, don't say anything bad about your job online because it can get you in trouble. Again, I'm going to reference the AARC if you look at the uh, probably couple Emails ago, they have their little update and news, and it was talking about social media and how situations you can be fired over it. And then practice your job interviews. What do you think the uh, most common reasons are for somebody not getting hired? Language. Language. Please do not use slang. You ask a question, not ask a question. Amen. All right? So it... Just being enunciate is very good. People coming in, we talked about appearance, they're being untidy, inability to express themselves clearly. So fumbling on your words a little too much, <coughs> lack of genuine enthusiasm, we can see that when you're sitting there. A negative attitude comes across, lack of eye contact, incomplete or sloppy 
Application, you're not going to even get to the interview phase. Arriving late for an interview. Like I said, my boss, he'll interview you. You're just not getting a job. And poor language skills. So I had some different references. And that's my email address. Hopefully it was informative. I enjoyed writing it. I've learned a lot. <laughs> so I actually learned some things. Like I didn't know about the STAR method. I didn't know the interview questions that I was getting were behavioral interview questions until someone that I know said, you know, research this. And I was like, oh, I've been to like five interviews that they asked me those type of questions. Now I know what it is. So I actually learned a lot from doing this. So if anybody needs to go, they're more than welcome. For so your CEUs, you have to do evaluations for Kelly. But does, and if you need to go, that's fine. But for those who don't, does anybody have questions? No problem. But. <laughs>